Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about mining meaning from full text. So this is something that I have been doing for over a decade. And because I was inspired by recently having to dig out my entire house from the snow, I thought this might be a good break for me uh, from shoveling my car out right now. So without further ado, let's go get started. I will say one thing before we get into this is with any machine learning project, make sure that you get your stakeholder expectations uh, handled. Make sure that everyone is on the same page as to what you're trying to achieve and what's actually realistic. That's not really the point of this video, so I'm not gonna really touch on it too much, but it is such an important part to your machine learning project that I wanted to say it here. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is find out how much full text you actually have on hand. You wanna do this because there's a lot of training that you're going to have to do depending on what your project is focused on. You need a lot of documents to be able to do that. If those documents are all OCR or worse, images of text, you have a whole lot more work ahead of you. So I'm going to put here up on the screen kind of my rank order on best formats behind your PDF and full text uh, versus the lower end. Again, doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means more work as you go farther down in that list. So if we are looking at, you know, classification types of exercises, you also want to make sure that you understand what format your training list of features are going to be. So if you're working with taxonomies, you might want to use a SCOS file or, you know, maybe CSV is fine. Um, being able to understand the path of the taxonomy so you understand the hierarchy, that's something that might be helpful for you. If you are doing entity extraction, what format are those entities in? Are you going to have some kind of contextual information like Mark Twain, the person versus Mark Twain, the author? All of those are also really good to understand before you get into your project because those are pre-processing steps you're going to have to do before you do anything else. The placement of text in, in full text documents. So traditional articles from a journal um, may have one or two or three even sometimes columns. If you're not using uh, XML, the machine learning is not going to know when one column starts and one stops. So it might actually read the whole text across all three columns. So be on the lookout for that. The other thing is if you're looking at like magazines or newspaper articles or even web pages, uh, that can be an issue. But also more important to those is ad placement. Sometimes the machine can't pick up if it's looking at an ad or um, maybe the text underneath an image rather than the actual full text. So this is where if you don't have tagging and you don't have zoning, you might be in for some, some trouble. It's not insurmountable, but you are going to have to go in and either select documents that don't have those issues, or you're going to have to address those by going through and just doing some image recognition perhaps, or um, going in and you know hand selecting different zones just on your training set. Again, that's not always, you know, useful and, and scalable, but if you're just doing a small training set, it might be doable for you. Another thing that happens with uh, text that has this issue is, uh, take for instance, a, a newspaper article that is not one article, but 27 articles. Why might that happen on one page? Obituaries, that's why. So each obituary is technically its own article or its own newspaper article, uh, but it's all on the same physical page from the newspaper. And this doesn't happen all the time anymore because you know we are kind of moving away from print in many areas, but it certainly still shows up because it's a legacy and people are just used to seeing it that way from the human eye perspective. You can see why this is not great for machine learning because again, the machine is not going to understand uh, having 27 different articles on one page if it can't figure out where the start and the end of each of those articles is if it's on one physical page. Another thing that happens in newspaper and magazines is insets or inserts. Uh, and that's not the little cards that smell like perfume. I'm talking about, you know, kind of like call out uh, boxes and, you know, uh, more design aesthetically pleasing to the eye layouts where there's maybe one giant image and then there's just like a few boxes of text on on maybe a page, 
oftentimes you also see an article started on one page and then it picks up that article on like five or six pages in. That happens a lot of newspaper data. So if you are doing machine learning on any of that kind of full text, you have to be careful. There is metadata that you could look at. So sometimes you'll see that the page range will start and then stop on a new page. That's a good indication. If the page uh, range is only one page, you might wanna go in and make sure that there's only one article on that page. Um, there's other metadata pieces that you can look at, like article type. If it says it's an obituary and it's only one page, you might want to be careful about that because it might mean that it's a page of obituaries. These kind of elements are going to mess up your machine learning models if you're not careful. So some articles actually have abstracts on the page in multiple languages. This is actually very common um, between English and French. That happens the most because like NATO, for instance, everything has to be in English and French. Um, in Canada, I think it also has to be in English and French. There's other countries where um, the main language and maybe another language have to be um, constantly represented. So um, they're, that's really good from a human consumption perspective. But from a machine learning perspective, you have to be able to pinpoint when that happens and if it's actually going to be useful for your model. If your model is all in English, you might want to just not use the French version of this abstract. And here's the thing. Usually you would hope that the metadata associated with this article will have language tags on each of the abstracts doesn't always happen. So maybe a good way to do this is go through first. And if there is multiple um, abstracts associated with any of your training set, make sure you go in and do a language detection um, model first. And so then you can identify which ones are English or which ones are French and only use which one your model is going to primarily be in. This also happens in the full text. So again, going back to my NATO days, um, a lot of the documents will have one column is in English and one column is in French. And if you don't train your model around this, very similar to the abstract, your model is going to be really messed up. So in academic articles, the abstract is one of your best areas for machine learning, especially for categorization or classification. What's the difference? So classification is maybe where you have a controlled list, maybe of subjects or research methods or things that you want to convey what this article is about, the aboutness of that article. Hands down, title and abstract are your best places to train your model. If you don't think that's enough, you can look at the first paragraph, which by the way, is usually just a duplication of the abstract <laughs> or the very last paragraph or section uh, of that full text. It's basically the intro and the outro or the intro and the conclusion. Those are great places for your machine learning model to figure out what the aboutness is. That doesn't mean the uh, other parts of the article are not important. It just means those are the most concentrated. And if you are processing a ton of full text, it can get costly. So if you can zone things out and make your processing go a lot faster and be a little less expensive, it's maybe a good idea. But when you're doing categorization, that's where you are identifying a category this thing belongs in. So that could be something like this article is an obituary or this article is an editor's uh, letter to the editor or this article is a case study. Those are categories of things or this article is in English or this article is in English and French. All of those are categories. When you're doing that, you do want to maybe look at the full article instead of just zones of the article. So one thing you might find in abstracts that you need to be watching out for is one negation. So this is really where you have to pick the right model for what you're trying to do. So if you know an, a an abstract has a lot of negation in it, it's actually very common for an author to say, this article is not about IoT. It's actually about the security of things in IoT. So it's a way for the author to actually specify the context for a human reader. That's great. But if you use, let's say, a bag of words model on your uh, abstracts, it's not going to pick up the not. It's just going to see IoT, 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 and it's going to think it's about IoT when it clearly says not about IoT. So just be careful of that. The other thing kind of in that same vein is um, any acronyms. Usually the acronym is spelled out the first time 
but then it's not spelled out any time after that. So you need to make sure your model accounts for all of those counting as the same thing. Um, formula is also something that you will see in abstracts that you have to watch out for because at least in XML, um, those formula might actually just be an image. It's not actually in the text. So the machine learning model wouldn't even pick up on it. Um, but if it is like a latex uh, kind of embedding of, of a formula, you want to make sure your machine learning model knows what to do with it, because if not, it's just going to mess up uh, your F score a little bit. Uh, you might also see structured abstracts. These are very common in medical, but I've started to see them more in like computer science and information science articles as well. And that's where they kind of go through what's the purpose? What's the conclusion? What was the method? Um, if you don't account for that in your models, if you are training on regular kind of unstructured text abstracts versus structured text abstracts, you're kind of mixing things. So you need to make sure that that is accounted for in your model. Um, if you are doing uh, categorization and you're just looking for what method was used, structured abstracts abstracts are great because it literally just tells you the answer. If you're doing some question and answering, that also might be a good area for structured abstracts. Now, I have not seen anything in the metadata that tells you if it's a structured abstract or not. So unfortunately, from my perspective, my experience, there's not a good way to identify them, but that might be something else your machine learning model might be able to do. Is there some kind of heading structure in the abstract? Maybe that means it's a structured abstract. And if that's true, then maybe add a flag, at least in your metadata, so you can use that in your training later. There are two other areas that you kind of see in that abstract area in the full text, but might actually be separate metadata fields. So that's author affiliation and uh, author keywords. So author keywords, just keep in mind, they are usually aspirational. That doesn't mean they're lying. It means that they are trying to trick the system <laughs> if they're smart about it, uh, where they're trying to say, OK, if somebody is searching on this this article type or on this technology, I want this article to show up for it, even though it might be kind of more on the tangential side. So just take author tags with a grain of salt because they're not expert indexers. And so it's not as reliable as, you know, some other structured data that you might have. The other thing is the affiliations. Oftentimes people don't do much with affiliations because the author name and the author affiliation are usually strings and they're very messy and not controlled. Uh, for instance, in a past life, I saw like five different versions of Ford Motor Company as, uh, as an affiliation. Ford Motor Co., Ford Motors, Ford, Ford Motor Company instead of Ford Motor Co. Like, because authors are just typing things in, they don't always do it consistently. Um, but this is one of the most important parts, I think, for author disambiguation, because you'll be able to identify, is this Jane Doe from this institution or from that institution? Uh, other pieces of metadata that would be helpful there is document type. So this Jane Doe was a composer because the document type is um, sheet music. But this Jane Doe is writing on astrophysics. Could they be the same Jane Doe? Of course, uh, you could do astrophysics and music. But typically, um, you can use that as maybe an, another data point to do the disambiguation for those authors. Um, a lot of people will also point out ORCID um, when we're talking about this specifically. But keep in mind, ORCID is usually only for uh, people that are alive. They don't usually retrospectively go out and make ORCID IDs for people. Sometimes they do, sometimes they do. Um, and also some institutions like universities will just make ORCIDs for everybody at their institution, not realizing that that professor, <clears throat> me, this happened to me, <laughs> uh, actually already had their own ORCID. Uh, so I was an adjunct and they made me one and I already had one. So you have to make sure you go in and, and merge those two together. Long story short, ORCID is great. But again, it's not going to treat for, um, you know, past authors all the time. And it's not always the cleanest data. So just be, you know, word of caution on that. So in that same vein, some of this information might not actually be in a field. And it might not be part of the abstract. It might just be some strange um, note in the full text. And if you have XML, it can be called out as maybe like an author's note. 
Um, but anything in that note is not really structured. So you might want to mine that out for affiliation or other pieces of information like contact information is sometimes in those notes. Those are really important areas if you are trying to do author dis disambiguation, but they're kind of like in this quasi universe between you know, actual metadata and just unstructured full text. So you might have to do some machine learning just on those areas if you have them. All right, and the very last thing I just wanna to touch on as far as full text goes is human in the loop. So you'll notice a lot of the things I was talking about today, they are really dependent on the health of the underlying full text. Sometimes you don't have that, or sometimes you just need help creating your training sets. Uh, because as we saw, even when you do have good XML or good HTML, it's not always clear if it's a structured abstract or not, right? There's there's some of those things. Um, there are two uh, approaches that you can use here. You can actually create your own human in the loop. Um, there are some tools, I'll put all of this up for you to see, um, that actually suggest things uh, to your human uh, counterparts who will be able to monitor and correct and then you can feed that into your model and also there is a human in the loop machine learning model uh, pipeline that AWS has a lot of people don't really talk about this although I have said this a few times on the channel because I use this all the time in various different projects uh, and it's incredibly helpful because it gives you a pipeline that's basically already set up for you and you just have to plug it in if you're using AWS. And last but not least, I'm going to put up on the screen um, two areas where some of this machine learning work can actually plug into your pipeline. Sorry, I use AWS all the time, but I am an AWS shop. I haven't really used extensively any other cloud architecture, so that's usually what I go with. Um, but you can find counterparts to this in the other cloud architectures. Um, you can see here that in the front end, that's where you might be doing some of your classification and your extraction of things to add to the metadata. And on the other side is things that you can extract from the full text to help with search. So that would maybe be author disambiguation and um, maybe some additional um, extracted uh, subjects in case those are not part of your taxonomy already. Maybe that's something that you can do further down in the pipeline. All right, so last, I am going to put up on the screen where this architecture might live in your larger pipeline. So a lot of what we were talking about here was things that would be added to the metadata or where you would find those training sets. Usually that happens earlier in the pipeline before it goes out to production. Um, something that you can do after or right before it goes out into production are things that would be like extracted impact sentences. You know, if somebody wants just a, uh, a quick brief on what the article is about instead of reading a full abstract or things like author disambiguation or even subject disambiguation. Uh, some of that subject disambiguation might be happening at the classification layer, which is in the uh, front part of the pipeline. But when it gets to search, are you searching in with multiple taxonomies? Well, that disambiguation is now a little bit fuzzier. So some of that stuff can happen later on in the pipeline. So I just wanted to give you a sneak peek on where this would kind of flow into your pipeline if you are starting to integrate that. And some of the things that I just mentioned about human in the loop, you can certainly do in either of these areas. If you're creating training sets with those, those human in the loop folks, that would be in the beginning of the pipeline. And if you are using them to maybe review the categorization or classification or maybe even author disambiguation, that might be something that happens uh, farther down in, in the pipeline because you've already got a model. Whereas the first situation, you don't really have a model yet. So maybe those are some things to help you consider where this stuff belongs in your pipeline. All right, so I really hope that helps you with your mining meaning from full text journey. And stay tuned because we have a lot more of this same kind of content coming up on the channel this year. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.